Part one will cover the historical period of the Renaissance. What is linear perspective? Brunelleschi's reinvention of linear perspective. <clears throat> we will look at a Northern Renaissance painting which was made without the use of linear perspective, and that's Jan van Eyck's The Arnolfini Wedding from 1434. Uh, we'll discuss Leonardo da Vinci, Perspective Genius. We'll look at The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa, and we'll finish with a look at Leonardo's notebooks and his desire to change the world through technology using linear perspective. The Historical Period of the Renaissance. The Renaissance was the historical period that followed the Middle Ages or medieval period. The Renaissance was the time when the art and philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome were widely embraced. This is sometimes called Neoplatonic or the New Platonic way, and that, that's based on the philosopher Plato's teaching from classical Greece. Remember that the art and philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome were already taught in the medieval educational system. These values became even more important during the Renaissance, the historical period of the Renaissance. During the Renaissance, European culture became a celebration of the values of individualism, realism, and love of technology. These values led to three things. One, the heightened idealization in representations of the human form. Two, the development of scientific experimentation that expanded the projective techniques, uh, technologies anticipated by Aristotle and Bacon, and three, the continued interest in communicative technologies and mass media, allowing for the multiplication of images and text in printmaking and printed books. And again, you would think about the invention of the printed printing press in 1440 that led to um, the ability to make books without handwriting them. Brunelleschi's invention of linear perspective was pivotal in generating many of the technological and ideological developments of the Re Renaissance. The development of linear perspective. Linear perspective is a system of creating an illusion of depth on a flat surface. All of the parallel lines, which are called orthogonals, in a painting or drawing using this system converge in a single vanishing point on the composition's horizon line. And you can see the vanishing point below, in the image below. Development of linear perspective. Linear perspective is thought to have been devised about 1415 by uh, Italian Renaissance ar architect Filippo Brunelleschi, and later documented by architect and writer Alberti in 1435 in his uh, book Della Pittura, or On Painting. Linear perspective was likely evident to artists and architects in the ancient Greek and Roman periods, but no records exist from that time, and the practice was thus lost until the 15th century. The three components essential to linear perspective to the linear perspective system are orthogonals or parallel lines, the horizon line, and a vanishing point. So as to appear farther from the viewer, objects in the composition are rendered increasingly smaller as they near the vanishing point. In the text for this class, Dr. Brown refers to linear perspective as, quote, the duplication of sight. And that's pretty amazing if you think about it in those terms. Linear perspective is a powerful tool for reproducing the three-dimensional reality we see in the world around us onto a two-dimensional plane, which would be a painting or a drawing. The illusion of creating three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional canvas or painting is a powerful way to match visual reality in an artwork. Since we are so accustomed to seeing the world through photographs today, it's easy to underestimate how powerful a tool linear perspective was for the artist. Dr. Brown tells the story of how Filippo Brunelleschi 
publicly revealed his discovery of perspective in Florence, Italy in 1425. 1425. And this is a spectator in front of the ancient baptistry of Florence in 1425, experimenting with perspective using Brunelleschi's mirror and painting created using linear perspective. Brunelleschi's story of linear perspective. Brunelleschi wanted to demonstrate that his newly discovered rules of linear perspective could reproduce the exact look of things to the eye, in other words, the illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. To show this, he had painted a small picture of the baptistry on a wooden panel precisely according to his newly developed method. After painting the building on the panel, he covered the area of the painting above the baptistry with a highly reflective silver leaf to produce a mirror-like surface, so basically a mirror. Then he drilled a hole in the painting. A person looking through the hole in the back of the painting at its reflection in the mirror held in front of it could then see more than the precisely painted image of the baptistry reflected on the silver leaf surface surrounding it would be the sky and the moving clouds, so it added to the illusion. Art historian Elton Davies called Brunelleschi's painting of the Florence Baptistry a milestone in cultural history and compared it to the Wright brothers' first flying machine. One of the biggest changes is the fact that this new way of seeing, remember John Berger, placed the viewer at the center of the artwork. If you stand in the right place in front of a painting painted using linear perspective, you are literally in the center of the image. The world of the image is created around you. In medieval art, the action of the artwork happened far above you. Think about Chart Cathedral looking way up at those um, sculptures and um, stained glass. And you walked around to see what happened way up there where the sculpture and stained glass in the cathedral are located. For the Renaissance, the artwork is created around you as the viewer at the center of the image. Now, I highly recommend that you watch the external video resource on linear perspective called Linear Perspective, Brunelleschi's Experiment. It shows you exactly, um, it, it remakes this story for you. Viewers of Brunelleschi's Linear Perspective painting were convinced that the drawing was a real duplication of the building because the linear perspective formulation created a more real image than anybody had ever seen. They were completely convinced of the realism. It's hard for us to imagine today what an impact seeing the first perspective images must have had. Human perspective is a human perception is a fluid, changing experience. More and more real. Few of us today would mistake the painting of a building for the real thing. However, the first time you experience virtual reality with a headset and motion controllers, you might be fooled by the perspective reality you step into. As technology advances in Western culture, more and more real images are made possible. Audience expectation and responses evolve with the advances. Perspective's essential ingredient, the vanishing point. All right, this is the definition of linear perspective that I would like for you to use for this class, not something you find by randomly Googling. Linear perspective as developed by Brunelleschi is the scientific mathematical formulation for creating the illusion of three-dimensional spatial recession on a two-dimensional surface. So it looks like a three dimensions, only it's on a two-dimensional plane, which is either the painting or the drawing. Linear perspective involves the use of receding parallels that appear to converge on a point on the horizon known as the vanishing point. The key component of Brunelleschi's formulation is the vanishing point. The perspective age begins. The world conforms to the human eye. We can look at two images from the history of art to understand the impact of Brunelleschi's discovery on Western art and culture. The first image, completed within 10 years of the introduction of perspective, is a drawing by Paolo Uccello, 
uh, who was a Florentine artist who was a friend of Brunelleschi's. Uccello, perspective of a chalice. This is a hand drawing, so there is no Photoshop used. And it was made by Uccello, you know, with a pen and ink, using Brunelleschi's theory of linear perspective. Uccello's drawing shows how perspective could picture man-made and natural forms with a proportional and measurable sense of objectivity. The second image was made some 400 years later. It shows an anonymous couple proudly holding a photograph of their friends or relatives in their hands as they pose for a, a photograph of themselves. The photographic process that was first patented in 1839 grew directly out of artistic and scientific applications of perspective images begun in the early Renaissance. Photography is the mechanization of perspective. No one foresaw the artistic and cultural changes symbolized by these images. Between 1425 and 1839, perspective replaced the cosmic geometry of the Parthenon and the sacred geometry of Chartres Cathedral with an art whose basic realism was justified by human perception itself. And this is a Brunelleschi um, a drawing example of a vanishing point. And you can really take a ruler and um, follow these lines and you, they all end up at that vanishing point. All right, so let's look at how space is constructed in a painting without the use of linear perspective. To understand how Van Eyck's use of space differed from Brunelleschi's or Uccello's, we can look at his double portrait, usually known as the Arnolfini Wedding or Giovanni Arnolfini and his Bride. The bride and groom stand in a domestic interior that is laden with Christian symbols, including, for example, the dog that symbolizes fidelity. Diagrams of the interior reveal that in spite of Van Eyck's considerable skills at pictorially reproducing the surfaces of faces and fabrics, he did not understand perspective. So this is Jan Van Eyck, The Arnold Feeding Wedding from 1434. Look at this painting and decide if you think that the three-dimensional space in the painting is accurately portrayed. This painting was painted without the help of linear perspective. The parallel lines of the floor, window, bed, and ceiling do not quote-unquote line up and appear to converge at the vanishing point. They do not constitute a consistent or integrated spatial configuration. So in other words, the space in this room uh, doesn't look quite right to our eye. As a result, Van Eyck's interior appears awkward and archaic to the modern eye. All right, we're going to move on to Leonardo da Vinci, and here's one of his self-portrait drawings. And this is his uh, very large... The Last Supper, and this was painted between 1495 and 1497 or 98, and it's located in Milan. Leonardo da Vinci, perspective genius. One of the most enduring icons of the period, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper was composed as an ideal perspective space. Leonardo, Leonardo was born in Italy in 1852, and he died in France in 1519. Vasari wrote that Leonardo was, quote, an artist of outstanding physical beauty who displayed infinite grace in everything he did and who cultivated his genius so brilliantly that all the problems he studied he solved with ease. His name became so famous that not only was he esteemed during his lifetime, but his reputation endured and became even greater after his death. And we're going to see that he be Leonardo was made into um, a cultural myth and, a, and a, a cultural icon. Leonardo was considered master of not only painting and the sciences of perspective and anatomy, but also of mathematics, engineering, and physics. All right, so Leonardo's Last Supper. 
Leonardo's skill in using perspective to frame the human figure is brilliantly displayed in his mural masterpiece, The Last Supper, from uh, 1495. Though damaged by the artist's ill-fated experiments with the medium and further damaged by dampness and the accidents of war, the fresco still retains a unique power. Leonardo's use of perspective in The Last Supper was part of his ongoing investigation of the relationship between art and mathematics. Leonardo used the most stable geometric form to underscore Jesus' stability. Jesus is configured as an equilateral triangle. By locating the vanishing point behind the head of Christ, Leonardo ingeniously framed the entire space of the scene on the central figure of Christ. Despite the agitated movements of the apostles, Christ had just announced that one of them would betray him. The symmetry of the architectural space surrounds Christ like a halo of order and calm. Christ is the controlling center, literally and psychologically, of the entire scene. Leonardo further unified his composition through his use of light. Although there are three windows in the back of the room, none of the disciples is lit from behind. Instead, they are all illuminated by an unseen light source in the upper left of the mural. The viewer's eye is drawn along the downwards diagonal established by the light from upper left towards the lower right and captured by the central iconic image of Christ. Leonardo took his use of perspective and light even further in order to have a powerful psychological effect on the viewer. The Last Supper is located in the refectory or the it's the dining hall of a monastery, and Leonardo painted the life-size scene so that the monks at their meals would appear to be in the same space as the table of Christ and the apostles. The Last Supper as an update or a remake. The psychological appeal of the Last Supper was enhanced by the fact that Leonardo brought the historic event into the contemporary context and altered it to reflect the upper class standing of its intended audience. Although the actual Last Supper took place in the attic of a Jerusalem inn during the first century AD, Leonardo situated his inside an Italian Renaissance palace. The artist also transformed Jesus and the disciples, so these are three 13 relatively impoverished men, into wealthy actors on the stage of history. Although Jesus and the disciples were members of the working class who probably took their modest meals while sitting on the floor, Leonardo shows them at an immense table covered with a linen cloth and set with silver plates. As the son of a carpenter, Jesus probably never wore clothes made of dyed fabrics, which were much more costly than plain textiles. Leonardo shows Jesus in bright red and blue, although red and blue dyes were expensive luxury items. Of course, the bright red and blue also draws the viewer's eye directly to Jesus. Can you think of a contemporary remake of an iconic story that is meaningful to you? Perhaps a film or book adaptation that is updated to a contemporary setting or location. Is it more powerful to you because of the contemporary setting? Last Supper as Enduring Icon. All of Leonardo's considerable skills evidenced in creating the Last Supper served to make it one of the central icons of Christendom. It has been copied, quoted, and parodied for centuries. Visitors to Milan can buy everything from t-shirts to ashtrays with images of the Last Supper on them. All right, so now we're gonna move on to Leonardo's Mona Lisa. And we're going to talk about this portrait as a, a celebrity. So Leonardo da Vinci, and this is the portrait of Mona Lisa del Giacondo. This was painted between 1503 and 1506, and it's painted in oil painting on a wood panel. And it's about um, 30 inches tall and 21 inches wide. So it's not that large. And um, it's currently located in the Louvre Muse Museum in the Department of Paintings. And we believe that the model is Lisa De Del Giacondo. 
although not everyone agrees with it. Leonardo da Vinci's most famous painting, some say the most famous painting in the world, is his portrait known to English speakers as the Mona Lisa. The painting portrays a fashionable young Italian woman seated on a balcony with a shadowy landscape behind her. She is shown in three-quarters view and wears a mysterious smile. The Mona Lisa allure has captivated people since its creation. Ever since Leonardo's time, artists have copied, quoted, and parodied the image. Advertisers have used it extensively to sell products they want to promote as masterpieces. And here you can see the painting has been the subject of numerous books, including the bestseller of uh, uh, 2003, The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, and in February of 1999, during the Clinton sex scandal, New York Yorker magazine put an image of Monica Lewinsky as Mona Lisa on its cover. Leonardo's Mona Lisa, a universal icon. British historian uh, Donald Sassoon has analyzed how the Mona Lisa became what he calls a universal icon. Sassoon says that the appeal of the Mona Lisa is a complex set of circumstances and that the artwork has been used in a, quote, largely unplanned and or unconscious manner for different ends, end quote, by many people over a long period of time. He asserts that a large component of Mona Lisa's appeal rests on its relationship to Leonardo, whose life and art have been heroically mythologized to construct him as the reigning creative genius of Western culture. So Leonardo da Vinci has been turned into a cultural myth as the most important creative genius of Western culture. Sassoon observes that da Vinci's painting is what he calls polysemic or open, an open work, meaning that it's open to a plurality of meanings and allows the viewer or interpreter to determine its significance. Um, and uh, so many different people look at this painting and think many different things. They have many different meanings that they attribute to the painting uh, that they have over time. All right, the Mona Lisa's changing meanings. The openness of the painting begins with debates about the identity of the woman painted. While most scholars believe she is um, Lisa Gerardini, not all agree. If she is, um, she was married to a Florentine merchant, and the painting is called La Giacondo in uh, France and La Giaconde in, uh, I'm sorry, La Giaconda in Italian and La Giaconde in Fran French. But confirming her identity would not close the meaning of the work. So just even if we suddenly found out exactly who she were, was, we would still have a lot of um, different uh, meanings that we ascribe to her. If Leonardo simply painted the portrait of a middle-class woman in Florence, why did he not deliver the painting to Lisa or to her husband? Why did the painting carry the Mona Lisa with him when he traveled to France to work for Francois I? After Leonardo died, the Mona Lisa had an exciting history which added layer after layer to the cultural meanings that we attribute to this icon. Francois I, the King of France, kept the painting in his bedroom until he died. It was on uh, public view after the French Revolution until Napoleon kept the painting in his bedroom from 1800 to 1804. The Mona Lisa returned to the Louvre for the rest of the 19th century, during which time it became an icon in the romantic cult of the femme fatale, that is, the exotic woman whose attraction is dangerous, often deadly, to her male victims. And um, Gautier, who turned the Mona Lisa into the archetype of the mysterious ideal woman to be worshipped on a pedestal. A few years later, poet Walter Pater famously compared her to Leda, to Helen of Troy, to Saint Anne, and to a vampire. He's got to make up his mind. All right, in 1910, Sigmund Freud psychoanalyzed Leonardo da Vinci. And then the Mona Lisa made the transition from femme fatale to kitsch icon in the mass media of the 20th century. 
One incident that propelled the painting into media celebrity happened on August 21st, 1911, when an Italian painter working at the Louvre Museum stole the Mona Lisa. Something more or less taken for granted became infinitely desirable in its absence. As the population of France mourned, the, the painting skyrocketed in popularity. Thankfully, it was soon returned to the Louvre, where it re reigns as the most sought-after tourist destination in art. Since the time of the theft, the painting has been used to advertise everything from videotapes to lasagna. All these different meanings confirm that the painting is indeed polysemic in nature. I invite you to Google and find some of the many ways that the image of the Mona Lisa is used today. Here's an advertisement made in the image of the Mona Lisa. All right, and let's uh, finish up by looking at Leonardo's notebooks. Leonardo was more than a great artist. He was a great scientist and engineer. Leonardo left over 2,000 pages of notebook drawings and ideas. Leonardo invent, envisioned the transformation of the world itself, a transformation largely made possible in science and technology as well as in art by the power of the perspective image. Changing nature through perspective. Leonardo wanted more than a better understanding of nature. He wanted to be able to control or change nature. Leonardo wrote not only that he wanted to, quote, know the secrets of things, but also, quote, I want to control rivers. His technological drawings show how this can be done through the linking pow of power with knowledge made possible by the perspective image. Leonardo's notebooks show what might be called the perspective mentality, that is, a way of thinking about reality based on the new viewpoint embodied in perspective. As John Berger notes, quote, the convention of perspective, which is unique to European art and which was first established in the early Renaissance, centers everything on the eye of the beholder. Perspective makes the single eye the center of the visible world. Everything converges to the eye as to the vanishing point of infinity. The visible world is arranged for the spectator as the universe was once thought to be arranged for God. Leonardo combined his interest in geometry with scientific investigation of the human form. He attended dissections of human bodies at the hospital in Florence so he could understand firsthand the way the body is constructed and the anatomy of the body. His drawing, entitled The Vitruvian Man, combines Leonardo's interest in geometry and his interest in anatomy in a depiction of an idealized male body arranged inside intersecting geometric solids. So you can see that he's inside the circle and also inside the square. All right, so this is the end of uh, chapter three, part one. Thanks for joining me.